Um, we'll inform the public we are waiting for a few more commissioners for a quorum. We currently have six members. We need seven for a quorum. So please hold tight. We're going to try to get another commissioner here. So thank you for your time.
welcome everybody to the May Planning Commission meeting. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we'll call the attendance. Call the roll, please. Arch. Here. Burning. Bollinger. Geinert. Hansen. Here. Holbach. Karpenko. Yes, thank you. Coop. Larsus. Larsus. Neither. Yes. Wagonist. Yes. And Wetzler. Here. Perfect. We'll stand for Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Carpankel, thank you very much for coming. I do appreciate it. I know you had another another conflict, but I do appreciate you showing. I extend my apologies. Thank and you. And my apologies calling. to all the public as well on behalf of this commission. So thank you. Um, with that, I need a motion to approve the last meeting's minutes from March 24, 2017. So, second. Motion by Carpankel, second by Wegnist. Call the roll, please. Barch, Approved. Burning, Bullinger, Hansen, yes. Wagnus, yes. Wetzler, yes. Larshus. Lar yes. Neither. Yes. Motion approved. Um, next will be the consent items. There are no consent items on this uh, this month's agenda. What that means is that all hearings will have a public uh, a public hearing so we'll move along to our first application uh, item number one this is a, a development by Northridge Villas rezoning re uh, revisiting the plat and also a PUD application um, this uh, address is located at North Avenue Northwest at 27th Street Northwest with that I'd like to hear the city's comments please yes sir mr. chairman and commissioners uh, Lance Lane principal planner uh, as the chairman stated, this is a Northridge Villas. It's a rezoning from R1 to R2 PUD, a revised plat, and then there's a plan unit development application associated with the zoning. And what that means, uh, plan unit development is uh, an opportunity to look at the project as a whole, to not only lay out the lots and blocks and whatnot, but also to look at the, the types of units that are proposed, the architectural style, the construction materials, amenity packages that might be proposed for recreational opportunities. Uh, uh, there may be topographic factors that need to be taken into effect and, and there's some flexibility to deal with that. So the PUD is, is part of the zoning. The uh, R2 is two family uh, residential zoning. This project was originally approved back in 2013, I think is R1, and then the, the oil field uh, went south and the economy tanked and a lot of things happen in the community that we all know about and so uh, the the streets and uh, utilities were actually installed but the uh, project stalled out and the developers have spent the last uh, few years researching the market and they think they've come up with an idea that uh, will fit well in the neighborhood with uh, a combination of R1 single family and what they're calling twin villas which would be the two family uh, type of residential unit. And uh, I know that the developers have a, a quite a comprehensive slideshow that they want to share with you, but there are several things I wanted to hit on. I'll, I'll try to be brief from the city's perspective. Uh, I know that there's some opposition to this project, and a lot of you out, out here want to speak tonight. Uh, and I have I have spoken to some of those folks on the uh, on the telephone and tried to answer questions as best I could and whatnot. And it seems to me that there's two issues that that uh, kind of rise to the top. There certainly may be more, I'm not speaking for you by any means, but it seems to me that uh, density and traffic uh, kind of uh, are the most often mentioned. And in terms of density, this is a low density development. Uh, density is defined in, in terms of dwelling units per acre, and low density is generally four dwelling units per acre, or four to eight dwelling units per acre. What the developer is proposing is about seven and a half to 7.8 units per acre. So they're within that range, albeit on the high end, but still within the range. 
And what they're proposing is a mixture of units so that uh, it's not determined for sure how many would be single family and how many would be twin villas, but on the, the proposal they have before us is uh, 12 or 13 single families with those concentrated on 27th where they're the most uh, visible, but certainly the twin villas could also become uh, single families in reality when, when this develops. And so if any of them do, that, that density would go down. If more twin villas are proposed, they can't exceed the eight dwelling units per acre. City staff won't support that because then it's no longer low oh, density. Yeah. Uh, the next step up from low density would be medium density, and that'd be like apartments or townhomes or row houses, and that would be more than more than two dwelling units in a structure at a higher density of dwelling units per acre. And city staff will not support a higher density in this low density neighborhood. Uh, the other thing is that the lots themselves are based on R1 standards. So an R1 or twin villa could be built conceivably on these lots, but they all are the size that would fit an R1. So they don't have a lot of little bitty lots that they're trying to put the small houses on to, to, to pump up the density. And the, and the final uh, point, I guess, is that if this PUD is approved the way it's presented, they will only be able to build single families and twin villas. They can't change their mind and say, well, I think we'd really like to put a fourplex on that lot or, you know, put a threeplex or, 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 or take this whole section and make it into apartments. They cannot do that. The PUD restricts them to what they present uh, and what's approved. There's some conditions attached that uh, the staff is going to recommend. If those conditions are approved and the PUD moves forward, uh, they will only be able to build either single families or the twin villas that are proposed. In terms of traffic, traffic to some degree is a function of density too. Generally speaking, low density doesn't cause concern. Tr uh, commercial areas, high density, true high density, like apartments, you get into 12, 15, 18 units per acre, those could be really problematic. But uh, what we generally do is we hire a professional uh, that's trained in traffic management and analysis, a professional engineer to, to do that analysis for us. And in the 2012-2013 time frame, the applicant did hire a traffic engineer to do that. At that time, they found that uh, there was no cause for concern, no, no road improvements, no road widening, uh, nothing like that that would be required. They based that on, uh, on average, average daily traffic, which is the number of cars on an average that would come in and out of the subdivision. And the, anticipate, or the estimated number was 362 vehicles which might sound like a lot of vehicles, but the, the threshold where it becomes any kind of concern from the traffic engineer standpoint would be 750. So it's uh, less than half of, uh, of the number. So there would be no need to do any road improvements to accommodate this traffic on the streets. The other uh, measure is the uh, peak hour. So during the, the, the hour that the most cars are coming in and out, what that peak hour is, there'd be 34 cars and again, 100 cars would be where there would be a concern from the traffic engineer, so well below 100, a difference of 66 trips. And uh, the city engineer reviewed the, the updated letter that was submitted by the professional traffic engineer and accepted that. And 27th Street is, uh, I, it serves as a collector, it, it does carry traffic. It goes a long way in both directions. It's a public street, it's meant to, to carry public traffic. So in a low density setting like this, the traffic not a concern uh, once this, the traffic re study reports came in. One thing that, that is a concern to the city is the, the, is the green space that's proposed. Uh, there's a, a greenway area to the west of this property uh, called Peterson Greenway, and it's a very nice piece of property, and the applicant has a vision of, of uh, developing that and, and having that be an amenity that not only the residents of Northridge, but also other neighbors in the, in the general area or anyone in the public could use and uh, ultimately having that be part of the Minot Parks District uh, land holdings. Uh, the problem is that it's not part of Northridge at this time and uh, they really can't claim to have ownership of it or control of it at this time. And so one of the conditions that you'll see in a few minutes is that the staff wants to have assurances that the, Green, the uh, Peterson Greenway uh, is actually going to be able to be developed in conjunction with the Minot Park, Parks District and uh, be 
an amenity that could be claimed as part of the PUD. So that's an important thing that we look at in the PUD evaluation is that the neighbors, even in a smaller uh, development like this, or a large development that they have opportunities for open space, for recreation, for kids to play, walk your dog, hike, bike, all those those great things. And uh, the Minot Park District actually has a, a uh, requirement that all development has to to uh, to, to uh, agree to a certain percentage uh, based on the number of lots and either develop a park or provide money or, or whatever. And I've talked with uh, Rob Merritt from the uh, from the Parks District, uh, and the applicants have met with him as well, and uh, I think everybody agrees it would be a great uh, park area, but the problem is right now uh, the, the applicant doesn't own it, and so it really can't be considered to be part of the PUD. Um, the alternative would be to take some area within the Northridge boundary itself and develop an amenity package. Since the streets and lots are laid out, that would be uh, somewhat restricted, I would, I would assume maybe a couple lots would have to be used for a playground or something of that nature. I know that's not the applicant's intent to do that, and uh, the, the applicant will speak later tonight of, of uh, this greenway and, and uh, how it would be dedicated to the parks district. There are, I always like to read the findings of facts, and of course, uh, the recommendations and conditions, recommendations, I'm sorry, and conditions that staff has, uh, has put together, we suggest that these will be appropriate recommendations for planning commission to include and, and their recommendation go on to council. But first of all, the findings of fact, this future land use map identifies the site as low density residential, single, single family attached and two family residential. The proposed density falls within the definition of R1 Single family residential zoning, the ratio of unit types will affect the overall density. Uh, the property is currently zoned R1 and platted into 33 residential lots and one other lot for utility purposes. Street paving and city utilities to serve this subdivision are constructed and are in place. The developer would like to offer a mix of twin villa homes and single family homes and therefore must rezone to R2. The developer envisions a unique residential community managed by a homeowners association with associated site amenities available to residents seeking this type of lifestyle. This approach lends itself to the creation and impl implementation of a planned <coughs> development overlay. The rezoning therefore becomes R2 slash PUD. The developer is maintaining the lot sizes and layout from the original approval in 2013 at R1 density. However, some revisions to lot lines cause the need for a new subdivision plat to be known as Northwich Villa's second addition. And finally, the developer does not own the proposed open space associated with this PUD. So with that, uh, the recommendations and conditions that staff has, has a, assigned to this uh, project are as follows. Number one, a developer's agreement with the city is required before the plat can be recorded. Number two, the developer is to upgrade the existing lift station on lot nine to a 440 volt system to meet city standards. Or alternatively, the developer can provide a 220 volt backup generator for the lift station to meet city specs per public works department. Number three, the applicant shall acquire or have the property owner dedicate the plus or minus 17 acre open space known as the Peterson Greenway to the Minot Park District for public park purposes, and the applicant shall be responsible for the development and construction of the hike bike trail with connections to the existing trail system at 4th Avenue Northwest and at the West Bypass. The applicant shall also be responsible for the proposed landscape plannings within Peterson Greenway as shown in the PUD application and any other work and agreement in coordination with the Minot Park District. Division and assignment of responsibility and scope of work for open space improvements as well as any required timelines or deadlines shall be established to set forth in the development agreement or in a separate agreement with the Minot Park District. And talking with Ron Merritt, there's agreements that can be made with, with the developer and the owner of Peterson Greenway and the city that all of these things could be ironed out and, uh, and that's what, what we need to have happen. Uh, number four, the PUD submittal, including all exhibits and drawings 
shall be made a part of the developer's agreement by reference. Number five, erosion control requirements were previ previously established for this development and remain in effect through construction. And the final number six, utilities and streets will be privately owned and maintained by a homeowners association. Bylaws and incorporation papers for said association are required prior to the filing of the final plat. So if the commissioners have any questions for me, I'd do my best to answer them. Any questions for city staff? Thank you. Planning and development application, if it's approved, is going to be restricted to uh, you know, to what to the twin villas and the single families that would keep it under eight, so they wouldn't be able to build anything else. But certainly, uh, for a comfort level or whatever, there could be a statement in the development agreement to that effect. I don't see why there, why there couldn't be. Thank you, sir. Uh, this time, I'd like to hear from the applicant. Uh, Mr. Chairman, member of the Planning Commission, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is John Zerman. Uh, I'm here to uh, represent the uh, uh, Northridge Villas Group. Uh, and the way we'd like to do our presentation this evening, normally we have uh, Donna Bai, who's with Houston Engineering as our planning uh, consultant on this project, and normally I'd make her do all the heavy lifting. Uh, but I wanted uh, to address you before she gets into some of the details on our presentation to address a couple of items that came up that make this situation a little bit different. Um, and a few of them stem from uh, the letter the Planning Commission received on the date of the previous, uh, uh, the April 24th Planning Commission meeting, which was the catalyst for us to hold this. Uh, in looking at that letter, uh, we felt it appropriate to review and thoroughly and hopefully competently address some of the issues that were raised uh, in the letter that Ms. Schmaltz uh, uh, wrote. Uh, and just uh, to start things off, I. Mr. Lang, I appreciate your, uh, your thorough uh, and, uh, and concise uh, evaluation of this project. We know it's been through a lot of iterations. Uh, we also appreciate the open dialogue with city staff and trying to develop and answer questions uh, that have come up during the process. Uh, I'd just like to add, um, and, and Donna, like I said, we'll get into a couple of the specifics regarding density and a few of the other things, but uh, one of the things that was raised in that letter was the traffic and density of, of the development. And just from a high level, what our plan is, um, and just to take a half step back, the reason that we are involved, or I, I'm in particular involved in this, is a bit of a long story, but it was a, a post-flood uh, handshake agreement uh, with the, the person that started this project. Um, that person rebuilt our church down in Eastwood Park after the flood, and there was a handshake agreement that if there was any troubles, we would step in and help. Well, when the bust happened, uh, we essentially stepped in. And, uh, and took over uh, for the original people. So in a sense, we're kind of, or I am sort of an accidental uh, developer slash tourist in this project. But being a, a Midas native, uh, I've taken pride in the project and trying to work with the neighborhood 
there are things that happened in the past we can't change or fix, but we're trying to look forward. And we're trying to work in an open dialogue with the neighbors to develop the best project going forward and fill out this last niche of that Northwest Minot neighborhood that's ready for development with the best and highest use uh, development we can put in there and one that hopefully strikes a balance with the Greenway, as mentioned, and we'll get into that discussion too, uh, that benefits the entire neighborhood, not just the Northridge Villas uh, PUD. But one thing I'd like to say is that what we're targeting here too, just to augment the, the data on the traffic study uh, and density, is that uh, we did purposefully hibernate this project for three years. It's no secret, people have seen the stories recently and months back about the real estate market you know, slowing down. Obviously, there's no, no secret with the energy and agricultural markets uh, creating hardships and population decreases and such. And so we took the conscious decision a couple years ago to set the project aside, even though, as Mr. Lang indicated, all the infrastructure is there, and all of that has been put in by the investment group. There have been no special assessments or any sort of, sort of uh, added cost to the neighbors that are there now. Um, and we had to take a step back and say, well, what, what do we think might work? And so with that time, obviously, the PUD is now a tool that's available in the developer's toolbox. And that was a result of the rewrite of the ordinances of, in Minot uh, that Donna was instrumental in uh, during her long tenure as the city planner uh, that provided the flexibility that this environment really calls for. And that's for developers to be creative uh, and try to use the tools that are provided within the ordinances and the laws to create the highest and best use development. We're trying to use the PUD here to essentially create a unique neighborhood with grassroots architecture where we're targeting a uh, 15 over sort of crowd that is an HOA guided neighborhood so the uh, neighbors are going to have a sort of hassle free living experience with now a lot of people that have spent the winters in Arizona or are used to that sort of development in other places it's it's familiar to them now whereas maybe 30 years ago or something like that it might not be and so we're trying to create a unique neighborhood with grassroots architecture you're not going to be able to find in mind it's a small pocket that's kind of tucked in there um, so we believe there's an element of privacy that's going to be interesting to people that are in that empty nester, snowbird uh, sort of class, the medical executives we're going to uh, target with this development because of the proximity to the bypass and the easy access to Knockwood, the new Trinity Hospital that's going to get built. And then we're also targeting a group what we're calling country to city people. And those are people that are out in the Stanleys, the Willistons, the Watfords, uh, the Tiogas that um, are getting up there in age and want to be closer to the amenities the city of Minot has to offer, whether it's medical care, the airport, things like that. And again, in a situation where they have sort of a hassle-free HOA that kind of takes care and looks after everything. So to Mr. Lang's point on the traffic study, that was done you know, with the assumption that it'd be sort of a normal you know, families living there and things like that. I would argue that we are going to get our share of snowbirders and empty nesters and people that are you know, single families, and there'll be a tighter density that the PUD allows with respect to the number of units. So you're going to have smaller yards. It's not necessarily going to be conducive to people with three or four kids and play sets and things like that. We're not going to prevent that or, you know, not allow that to happen. But the likelihood is the market, as it figures it out and as the, as the project evolves, will likely have a lower density of activity, if you will, from a traffic standpoint and such that even is, uh, you know, reflected in the traffic study. So. I wanted to address that part. And the other thing, too, on a higher level is that in the uh, letter Ms. Schmaltz had kind of uh, done, I guess uh, you could call it an ad hoc traffic study. And I guess, um, as, as you know, I've resigned my position as the chairman of the Planning Commission just to hopefully uh, minimize any potential conflicts here. But I can tell you in my roughly 10 years, uh, it's a dangerous sort of proposition if we as a city, whether it's the Planning Commission, the City Council, or whatever uh, group, gets away from the science that drives and, and guides these sorts of decisions. I think uh, Mr. Lang did an excellent job talking about how the process of a traffic report works. We all can grab the back of an envelope or a napkin and write down what we think the estimates are going to be. But if we as a city say, hey, you can kind of come up with your own sort of approach to this, and we kind of take that and run with that versus what's the established science on a process, what's the established way of doing things, what's the standardized way of doing things, we're going to isolate ourselves as a community from not only local developers wanting to take risk, but other people coming in here as we hopefully turn the corner and see more activity and development and economic growth in mind. And so I just want to make a, a level on a, a comment on a higher level there, hopefully. And then again, Donna will address some of the specifics that should hopefully build on Mr. Lang's comments regarding the, uh, regarding the traffic study. Uh, the other key area that I wanted to address before I turn it over to Donna here 
uh, was the conflict of interest section of Ms. Schmaltz's letter. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, I take pride and took a lot of pride in being on this commission for nearly 10 years and it was because it was a chance to serve my hometown. As you noted in the letter, I saw lots of highs and lows, challenging situations, uh, things that were, were tough. Uh, nobody gets all the decisions right. Uh, but at the same time, this is the first time in probably a thousand agenda items where I've actually had a direct conflict. As I mentioned to you, I'm kind of an accidental developer here, but trying to make the most of the situation, not only for our group, but importantly for the, the, the neighborhood and the city itself. And so I think that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of unfortunate that this has happened. I had fully intended at the last meeting to recuse myself fully from the meeting, but with the arrival of that letter on the day of the meeting last year, um, and again, as I reflected on it afterwards, it wasn't something with, that we could come up here that, not, that night and uh, respond to. Uh, I felt it appropriate, or most appropriate, to, to tender my letter of resignation, uh, reluctantly so. Uh, the second part of that, uh, regarding conflicts, uh, are related to Donna. And um, I think it's kind of unfair that that, that that shot was taken, and I'll use that term, because I did have the good fortune of working with Donna through many of the years where she was essentially a, a one-woman planning shop. And it was during the years that were during the boom, post-flood, during the rewriting of the ordinances. And I can tell you, we started talking to Donna shortly after she left the city um, as coming on to this role because, again, it's not our expertise. She is an expert in planning and ordinances and the sort of thing we needed to understand on what sort of tools are in that toolbox to create the best sort of product here, not only for the neighborhood, but what we're trying to achieve as the group in charge of the development of Northridge. And I can tell you that we chose Donna for her expertise, her professionalism, her competence, and her temperament. And I can tell you that there's no way that uh, we would be this far with this process without her. And I'd also like to make a final comment regarding that. And it's a little dismaying that uh, things can just kind of get thrown around, I guess, in the day of fake news, anything is possible. But there was a very personal uh, attack, if you will, on Donna in that letter where it was specifically stated Uh, her husband was and still an investor in Northridge Villas and from Mrs. Schmaltz's letter. I can tell you that Donna and her husband have been longtime friends, probably close to best friends with my little brother and his wife going back to high school days. So there's a long relationship there. I already told you why we picked Donna to work with our project. But I can also tell you that at no time has Roland, her husband, ever been an investor in Northridge, nor will he be. Um, and it's just, I think, a little unfair that you have gasoline thrown onto some embers with that sort of statement. And we wanted to really step back and reflect on the appropriate response to that as we read that letter a month ago. So we are happy to be in front of you, uh, and we're looking forward to following through with the, the details that Donna will present here now. I'd ask that she'll likely address some of the questions that you might have with her part of the presentation. So I'm going to step aside now and then we'll both be available for questions when she wraps up her part of the presentation, if that's all right, Mr. Chairman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Planning Commissioners and audience members. I'm Donna Bai. Um, as John mentioned before, some of you know that I used to sit on the other side of that podium. Um, I'll do my best to uh, stand here in a, in a new position with Houston Engineering. Um, and represent this client. Um, I will be up here twice tonight, so I apologize for um, that monotony. <laughs> um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the background of this. You have a lengthy staff report that was prepared for you by the Planning Commission, as well as the information that John was given uh, just a brief moment ago. But this project does date back to 2013. Um, it has laid idle for a couple of years now and is really ready to be moved on and developed. I want to keep that background brief so that we can focus on the positive and, and futuristic outcome here. Um, where? Uh, when I was planning uh, in the planning department, oftentimes we made sure that our planning commissions went out and either drove it or, or we provided the details within that, that planning packet that you received probably just a week ago. Um, this is for those that, that weren't able because of the holiday to, to find their way out there. Um, this property is located in Northwest Minot, just uh, northwest of Bel Air School. And uh, it is, as mentioned, a 34 lot replat subdivision. The lot lines were adjusted 
um, to make room for some of the new uh, paired villas. Um, it's located approximately at 9th Avenue Northwest, just south of Eagles Landing. Um, during the past two months, we offered three neighborhood meetings with approximately 10 people attending each of those um, and two aldermen. Um, it should be noted that it was the same 10 people at, at each of those meetings. Um, a postcard was sent out each time with a contact information on it for both the developer and myself, and we did not receive any additional um, calls, requests for information, etc. Uh, this development offers a mix of choices uh, between the single family and the two family style housing. Uh, the lots uh, labeled as PV or paired villa can also be built a single family uh, on single, fa single family homes on, on those lots. Uh, the lots are labeled single family are conducive to that size or because of that size width uh, or depth of lot. Um, there are a minimum of five styles uh, of each housing type and the model home is located along 27th Street Northwest. Um, the future land use map and reference, um, at the time the map was adopted, the city council, um, by the city council, the landowner, um, the land owned by this LLC was not designated or annexed yet. Um, the map uh, zoomed in section of the NRV land is noted that it is completely surrounded by low density residential, um, except for a small piece just directly east of it. Um, the section 13-3 of your zoning ordinance basically states that the uses are generally associated uh, with the land use map and are only the uses that should be considered. Um, unless an applicant would seek um, to change the land use map and the zoning to a higher density, it really assures this neighborhood that the proposal would be the highest density allowed for per both of these previously approved documents. In other words, it would take a mountain to move the Planning Commission, City Council, and neighborhood to approve any other type of use in this area. The PUD and the zone change request, if approved, would be in stone and the only submitted, and only submitted can be built. Northridge and Houston Engineering representatives met with the Park District officials on March 27th. The Planet Park District submitted a letter on April 11th in support of working with the applicant and the owner on the development and ultimately the dedication of the Greenway. While the developer's agreement will be, of course, put in place between Northridge and the Minot Park District, it's currently envisioned that Northridge would build the initial trail system in lieu of the dedication fees or having the Park District needing to budget these construction costs. We have a trail easement uh, for quite some time now with the owner of that green space. That tra trail easement has been recorded with our Ward County Recorder's Office. We've been in constant conversations with the Minot Park District, um, and we have a number of solutions to help um, seal that up. Um, using the same trail surface as the new Woodland Trail ensures this continuity. Um, this would likely be known as the Peterson Trail to um, complement the, the dedication of that from the current property owners. A uh, similar sign as the one pre um, presented here at the Woodland Trail would be erected and possibly some other amenities that um, would be give a historic account of, of what occurred there in the past 100 years. We've had some coordination with a lot of entities on this project over the last couple months. Uh, we've met with the DOT. They've approved um, the trail access uh, with a specific type of gate to connect to the existing bypass trail. Um, certainly that type of gate would be to deter any four-wheelers or, or access that way from, from uh, vehicles um, coming into the neighborhood or coming into this trail system. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the Park District um, really supported our integration of the cohesive trail connections. Not everyone is looking for a paved concrete or, or um, uh, asphalt path, looking for more of a natural path, and this area really offers that as an amenity. The new Greenway Trail would create a safer neighborhood walking system. These were pictures that have been taken uh, just this year um, since the snow melted. Uh, the 27th Street sidewalk network is really incomplete. Um, Many of you know that uh, the um, previous years in the Planning Commission, there were all some times um, that the council elected to omit sidewalks from new development and certainly not require them as part of the planning process. Those are in place now. 
Um, but unfortunately, there are people that still have to walk out in the street, whether the sidewalk isn't wide enough or it's not continuing. Um, and so that was something that the developers noted and really wanted to make sure um, that they would, would have some um, improvements uh, regarding this. Um, the architect specifically designed these homes to reflect the character um, that is known as a grassroots architecture. The style of the homes will complement the surrounding styles of homes, and the single family and paired villas will almost be indistinguishable from each other. This type of housing unit is unique to Minot, but not, other, but not to other Midwestern communities. The single family home concept for instance, on a general one, would have a, any number of bedrooms between five and six at the most, number of bathrooms between four and five, square footage is in the range of five to 5,000 to 6,500, potentially a third car garage, and the master bedroom could be located really on the main or the second level. On one of the twin villas or paired villa options, the number of bedrooms would be reduced, uh, potentially as, as well as the number of bathrooms. The square footages would potentially be smaller at 2,500 to 3,500, uh, probably likely designed with just a two-car garage and a master uh, bedroom located on the main level. This map you've seen previously, uh, just labeled a little differently here. The paired villas are the PV located within these lots. These are the lots that were adjusted to be a little bit larger to handle the footprint of the twin villa. Uh, they certainly can still be used uh, for single family lots. And then the ones labeled in red as SF are ones that really only could handle the footprint of a single family home uh, for driveway, garage widths, uh, and, and those types of things. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the density comparisons that uh, were referred to in the staff report. Um, Underneath the zoning ordinance, I just took these lines directly from that. The district is established in which the principal use of the land is for single family dwelling units. The district has a low density range of four to eight units. And many of these uses um, permitted in this zoning district include golf courses, schools, parks, and group homes. I make mention of that because those are certainly um, uses that could create more traffic than what a single family home neighborhood would. A two-family residential district is really intended to establish areas for the development of a mixture of single and two-family housing and broaden the choice of residential living styles in the city and promote a quality development. This district is also considered low density from four to eight units and those same similar uses are permitted. Some of the key features we wanted to mention and amenities, again, John stated the HOA is a controlled neighborhood uh, development type of guideline. Um, those documents that are recorded with the flat itself become law, they become in stone, they become a rule or regulation, um, and, and ultimately the word ordinance is in place. The grassroots development and architecture produce these great design guidelines. You've seen them. Um, the packet is, is thick and lengthy for a reason. Um, I'm sure uh, many of the items that we provided didn't make the final packet just for, for sole purpose of saving trees and, and space on your hard drives, but we really wanted to have all of the details in front of you and for you to read through those and understand our project. The targeting of the 50 plus age group was something that um, at this um, price point, location, size, and style is something that um, the developers have heard in reviews um, and engagement conversations with some of their potential buyers. This uh, pocket privacy and, and close proximity to city amenities, we talk a little bit about this infill development, this little niche um, that's waiting to be finished. It has been started, it has a roadway, it has sidewalks and street lighting. Um, there's a lot of walkers um, that currently use that, whether it's pushing a stroller, pulling a wagon, walking a dog, bikers. We've seen all of those people using this neighborhood um, during those three neighborhood meetings. Uh, with the purchase of your lot, um, you get a five-year Varden Golf Club membership. Um, you also get uh, an opportunity to start to meet your, your neighbors. You will be in an HOA with them. This is a great social way of engaging um, uh, those buyers in um, a new neighborhood. We 
I kind of skip over a little bit on the traffic impact because it's been mentioned twice. That newest update really reflects the 13 single family structures and 20 structures or 40 family units. And that greatest peak hour will just add 34 vehicles or a 100 vehicle threshold to the required adjustment. Um, the developer has met with the city public works and engineering departments as well as the planning and traffic. Um, the public works and the developer are working together to add an emergency generator capacity to the lift station that's already currently in place. There's a picture of it here. The developer and the adjoining landowners are creating this new trail connection and dedicating it to the Minot Park District as part of their existing trail system. That is certainly a condition that our uh, developer supports that was written in the staff report. So here's how we're working with the community. This PUD submittal must be included in the developer's agreement. It has the zoning de designation underlying. The density will be included in the agreement, whether it's a single or two family designation. The lot sizes fit with the R1 zoning. We want to maintain a neighborhood communication throughout this development via email updates to those interested neighborhoods, probably a, uh, whether it's a Facebook page or a web page that talks about the development, working with the realtors that are really going to help market these. Northrid fits this community, it fits our community. And, and on the left side is some concerns that were uh, originally produced in that letter and some of our responses. The first one, and I only highlighted four here, and then we'll be wrapping this up shortly. Some neighbors wanted to keep it agriculture or undeveloped and are not open to the change from R1. Our response is that the developer wants to complement the neighborhood with a unique development and low density. One concern stated, density and housing types are not favored by the neighborhood. Our response is the developer is proposing single family and two family units that fall within the city's requirements. Another concern was traffic to and from the development will be disruptive and concerning to families, especially those with children. Our developers provided a traffic analysis and an updated analysis that falls within those national standards for traffic safety. This roadway design with its curving nature will actually provide traffic calming and encouraging a driver to reduce its speeds. And a final concern here, the development will burden the parks, the schools, the public utilities and other things. Our response is the tax revenue each year contributes to schools <coughs> and the city. Utility companies, both public and private, the park district and the school district have been in support of this project. With the POD and the R2 zoning, the neighborhood gains. Defined guardrails for what can and cannot be built. These are only single family and detached two family dwelling units. A developer's agreement with the city and the HOA that further control the ultimate nature of the PUD. This is orderly versus chaotic development. As mentioned in some of our neighborhood meetings, many of these people lived through the nightmares of the flood um, up on the hill. They had constant construction, constant traffic, and some of them even had construction company um, problems with their own homes. Or, or their neighboring homes, or drainage issues. We all know that was a wet year for many of us. By having the developer sell these lots off under their own auspices, they will be able to control when these developments, or when these lots are developed. Without the rezoning, uh, this could create problems seen in other developments. And without the addition of the POD, the Greenway is unlikely to be developed. Our client is in agreement with all the conditions. I want to wrap it up. We're both available for questions if you have any. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions for the applicant? Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to clarify two quick points. As Donna mentioned, we've had three uh, meetings with neighbors. The first one, we did send out a postcard to the entire notification list that was provided to us from the planning department provided an email and phone contact. The subsequent two were results of the neighbors coming back. In the first case, uh, it happened to be Mr. Maltz was traveling and requested a follow-up meeting, and then we had another meeting after that. So we did send out the postcard for the first one, and then it was communication amongst us, just so, just to clarify, there weren't three postcards sent out to the uh, distribution area. And the other point, I think, to clarify, Donna, is our intent is obviously to put sidewalks in as we develop it, but the neighbors have been using it as a walkway and as sort of a dead-end pocket are probably safer walking, you know, on the side of the street there than on 
the base of 27th Street, uh, as noted in the, uh, the slide on the presentation. So. Thank you. Applicants, any questions? I'm sorry, uh, commissioners, any questions for the applicant? I do have one question. What will the phasing look like for the open space amenities? That trail system that uh, you plan on constructing, what, what will the phasing look like for that? Our plan with that, and we've got a uh, uh, open and ongoing dialogue. As Donna mentioned, we have a recorded trail easement in place. Um, we've had a number of conversations with the landowner. Uh, he's just returned from his winter down in Arizona. Um, he was traveling this weekend. We have a note into him uh, per kind of the recommendation from staff to create some clarity on that, where our intent is in the coming weeks here to hopefully strike a deal where we actually will purchase that land. Um, as Donna mentioned, she's had conversations with the park districts. There's other ways to approach this, um, even if ownership will re remain retained with the existing owner until the dedication happens. So there's different, different paths, I think. Our preference would be to take the most direct path. And honestly, with the way timing is, our hope would be if we can you know, successfully get through uh, planning commission and city council would be to focus on getting a few model units built. We feel we, feel we have some pre-sale demand for a couple of the units. Focus on that this year and then use uh, you know, the longer runway to team up with the park district and start next spring on the trail system versus saying, hey, we need to have a recent pub that went through. We need to have 50% of the units sold and occupied. Our interest is in getting that amenity in there because that will also help us with the marketing of the, of the North Bridge itself. So sooner rather than later, but more realistically, as soon as we get those things in place, it's a next spring sort of start, but hopefully, you know, a month or two to build it up. I defer to the engineering experts on that. We do plan to use Houston, who has specialists in the trail development, to, to see the, uh, the plan laid out and then, you know, us executing on that next spring. Perfect. Thank you. You know what the questions will have you? Oh, question. Go ahead, Mr. Hansen. I don't know if this is a question for you, John, but would this said Peterson Trail concept that they're presenting fulfill your condition, condition three? <clears throat> your question is that would the Peterson Trail be held to this condition as opposed to waiting the next spring or whatever? I, I guess I don't know. Sorry, let me clarify. You, you make it a condition that you want Greenway and that they should make uh, a purchase of the Greenway for a, a trail or for purposes of a public open space, would that be enough to satisfy that third condition? Well, <clears throat> I, I, the city's preference is certainly that, uh, that it would be more than just a commitment to do something next spring, because the issue is that the, the property that, that is contained in the Greenway is not part of the North Street property and it's being represented as part of PUD. I understand the trail easement is recorded and they have rights to that strip through there, but that's not the, the, the whole Greenway area. And I think the idea is to have the whole Greenway area with the trail included be, be part of the Minot Park District's property holdings. And, and so we need to have some way to do that. I don't know that next spring, you know, leaves a lot out in the air, but I would say in the interest of moving the project forward, if the commission is agreeable, that it could be recommended to move forward with these conditions and then the owner could work to get this done for the city council. And the council is going to have the option to either uh, approve it without the trail hammered out or to require it to be hammered out or to send them back through, remand them back to planning commission to present a different amenity package that would be contained within the Northridge property itself that they actually control. Commissioner, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Chairman uh, Neither and uh, Mr. Lang and Commissioner uh, Hansen. Yeah, our, our intent is to bring clarity to that. I mean, this is a new condition versus uh, what was in the staff report from the previous month. And uh, our, our intent is to, you know, move aggressively forward with working with the landowner to get a, uh, an agreement that's satisfactory, uh, that satisfies the condition uh, above and beyond as it is right now. Um, and I think my comment regarding the timing, I think, is a, 
um, if you think about it in the whole context of things, is, is reasonable. What we hope to do uh, is, is lock that down so that it is part of the Northridge development or create the kind of clarity in a partnership with us, the landowner, a developer, you know, a trail development agreement, and us with the financial commitment to develop it that satisfies the condition as well uh, with the ultimate dedication uh, to the park district. So um, our hope is that, A, we get clarity around this in a way that satisfies the condition as it's written now, and B, we start to lay out, you know, a thoughtful plan for the development of it rather than just, you know, bringing a skid steer in there and starting to clear things out because as we've talked about, uh, uh, Mr. Lang, uh, you know, our intent is to have it be a, you know, have trees planted, have it be a, you know, a wooded sort of enhanced trail, not just something raw cutting through there, even if it's the same trail material as the Woodland Trail. Does that answer your, your question? Any other questions for the helping? Go ahead, Mr. Barch. Uh, stay, sticking with that trail now, is the public going to have access to that trail from there? Because uh, <laughs> Ms. Buys presentation, 27th Street is missing sidewalks in a lot of areas, especially in the middle, there's some on one side, but then pretty soon you're out. So would the public be able to come down through there and access that trail? Yeah, our, our intent um, is absolutely. And you know, the sooner that we could have it dedicated to the park district, but even when it was built, the intent, and it ties into 27th Street north of Northridge, um, in a, a part of the coulee that opens up to the street that's, again, that green area that was contained in that 17 acres is what the trail easement includes right now. So this would be a fully public op you know, trail open to the public and it would create a new connector to that entire northwest neighborhood up there, whereas there isn't one now unless you go up to 19th and walk you know, to the bypass uh, trail at that point. So the short answer, uh, Commissioner Barch, is yes. It would be fully open to the public and obviously ultimately it would be a park district uh, trail. Um, just a question in your conversation with the owner of that 17 acres. It appears that that's really not useful for anything else anyway. Would that be a true statement? Uh, Commissioner Karpanko, yes. That's, that, and that's well understood by the developer as well. So, I mean, it's been stated by the developer. I'm sorry, the owner. The owner, Mr. Okay, Mr. thank Thompson. you. So that's yep. kind of where I'm heading is it, you know, there should, you, you should be able to come to some sort of an agreement we're, we're, on partnership on that 17 yeah, acres. We're very so hopeful. I mean, yeah, and, uh, and and just to follow up on that, uh, Don had made reference to some his historical markers, uh, Commissioner Carpenko, and our intent with the Peterson Greenway um, is that that's where their family had homesteaded, and there are still some relics from the old farm there. So what we'd like to do is tie in a few markers there just to say you know, who the homesteaders were, where the name came from and such, and in uh, speaking of the Park District, they certainly have no issue with it being called the Peterson Greenway, and that'd be a likely contingency of any purchase and ultimate dedication to the Park District as well. So, yes. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Mr. Begnus. I have a question. Um, in staff's presentation, uh, there was a, a term used, privately owned streets. How does privately owned streets address public access? My answer to that would be that the, the, the public could come could come in there, there wouldn't be any barriers or anything. Correct. Uh, but the maintenance and obligations and whatnot would be the HOAs. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Lyon, Commissioner Wetzler, yes, that the, the, the street will be owned by the HOA and maintained by the HOA. There will be, you know, for example, the city will be taking over the the lift station per the you know the requirements discussed and there's already a similar setup for example at the lift station near Perkett that has the emergency generator so we sat down and talked that out with public works and that's likely the direction we'll go to satisfy uh, that situation um, but yes yeah, so the way that we um, are envisioning the initial build out of Northridge is that the street is owned uh, by the HOA um, maintained by the HOA but we'll have public access and I understand that, that in the development phase and the sale of the homes and until a whole area is built, um, that's, that's the concept. But the HOA could change their mind 10, 15 years down the line and say, hey, this is a privately owned street, we want to other people down here. Yes or no? The, the, the agreement, the 
the Peterson Greenway, if everything kind of falls into place that it's envisioned, would be open to the public, it'd be why not Park District, so they couldn't close it off. Mr. Lane, that is correct. Yes, the Greenway would be permanently open to the public. I don't know why. Irrespective of how the neighborhood may develop. I don't know why you would need to go into the Northridge development unless you lived there and wanted to visit somebody or whatever. If your concern is getting around through the area, then if the Greenway turns out the way it's supposed to, then so it'd be why not Park District and they'll control what happened in there once it's dedicated to. Correct? And Chairman Neither, Commissioner Wetzler. Um, our, our goal is to see this developed in the, in the next couple of years here in the highest and you know best quality way. Um, what HOA, <laughs> what an HOA might try to do five or 10 or 15 years down the road is, is merely conjecture and I wouldn't speculate. But uh, again, as part of uh, what we've set up there, um, the road will be owned by the HOA and maintained by the HOA and the city is aware of that and in, in, in agreement with that approach with respect to public works and such. Go ahead, Mr. Quickness. Just one comment. The city has no control for authorization over the HOA. Mr. Chair, uh, I wouldn't think that the city could put any rules on the HOA. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Go ahead, Mr. Quickness. Just a comment about public access, if, if the concern to address public access is acce accessing the trail, it would seem to me you would access the trail either at 4th or you would come up on the top end and access that park trail because once once those lots are all filled in and developed, it's not like the public is going to be cutting through people's yards to access the trail. The thing that, that would still be accessible if they chose to, they could still walk the inside roadway with public access, but to access the trail in my opinion, once it's built out, wouldn't make any sense because then they would be cutting through people's yards. Is that a part what? of your concern? Yes, Chairman. Chairman, I don't want to argue that issue because I feel differently about that. A public street is a public street. A private street is a private street. I guess, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I believe that there are HOAs in town right now that maintain their streets as privately owned streets that are still completely open to the public. Um, and like I said, in this case, you've got, uh, you know, sort of an isolated pocket that Northridge represents and, and to what Commissioner Karpenko was saying, um, there is the likely option of something maybe tying in directly to the neighborhood that doesn't go through people's yards. Uh, but the main thing with the Greenway is that that will be fully accessible to the public, you know, at all times and will connect at 27th Street at the bypass initially. And then there's a second, second set of land that's not included currently, a second portion to the south, if you will, owned by the same owner, that would be the logical connection through the old farm road down to 4th Avenue. But the originally envisioned trail that we've discussed tonight would tie in for the public at 27th Street, north of Northridge, uh, probably a half dozen houses or so, where the opening is up there, and then connect directly to the existing uh, north-south trail system on the bypass. Uh, one other thing, Donna had made the statement in her presentation that without rezoning, it could create problems seen in other developments. I guess I'm kind of curious what that would be. Thank you for asking that question, Commissioner Barge. The, the chaos that I was referring to is really a development to the north of this. Um, a lot of the, originally the developer had come in um, and wanted to create a hundred and some lots, hundred and 87 or whatever it was, annex them and plot them all at the same time. That was kind of unheard of uh, in the 15 years that I worked there that someone wanted to develop something that large. And so we were apprehensive of it at first, but certainly that was just prior to the flood. And then all of a sudden, everyone wanted a lot outside the floodway and wanted to build on it. And so those developers of original ownership just started selling them off to individual people, individual construction companies. And so, um, and then Meanwhile, tried to develop the infrastructure and the roadways underground around it. And so it became chaos just for that reason. Um, that comment really shows that the developer here wants to sell them off, have them developed and built by one or two builders in an orderly phased fashion. They're not aggressively going out and just lottering the lots. So I hope you understand it. 
One final question for the applicant. There was a previous uh, application that was a PUD that was required to have off-street parking. Um, now, this project, of course, will not have off-street parking. Is that correct? If I remember correctly when I studied that, um, Chairman Neither, um, that one had a narrow street. This one is built to the full extent of what a public street would be. So it has parking on both sides, has parking, has garages, and then has um, the standard setbacks of 25 feet. So there would really be no need in this neighborhood to have additional gas parking. And the other application I'm referring to is a little bit higher density units. So thank you very much for those comments. Hey, Chairman Neither, one last comment to make there too. And part of the evolution of the process and the ultimate product that we're trying to put on the market here uh, is includes two bedroom, I'm sorry, two, gra uh, two stall garages for all the twin villas. Previous designs on the architectural side did not have that. So we've actually addressed, you know, reducing cars and driveways and such by making sure each of the twin villas has a, a you know, full two-car garage and the, the single-family homes will likely all have three-car garages. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak in favor of this application? Hearing none, uh, would anybody in the audience like to speak in opposition to this application? Please step forward. Hi, I'm Angie Benes. I live at 709 27th Street Northwest. My backyard is up against the new development. Um, I'm gonna keep it short and sweet. I've been up here like for five years. We started in June 11th of 2012. It was actually not 2013, it was 2012. That's when we got our first letter um, about the development. Prior to it, it was egg. We loved it, that's why we bought where we did. We loved the backyard, the view. That is gone. I understand that it will be developed. I understand the streets are there. I understand the water is there. I get it. When we were going back and forth with the developers back in 2012, it did go through as an R1. We agreed as a neighborhood that R1 was the best fit because we are all R1. It was the best fit less vehicles, they were going for an R4 when it first came through, and city council made it an R1. <clears throat> I'm just gonna read a little bit. Our neighborhood has been fighting this development since 2012. The land started as egg, now it's, it was proposed R4, it is R1. I believe it should stay in R1. Single family dwelling, 34 lots. All adjacent dwellings are single family dwellings. This addition should match its surroundings. It is not an extent of an R1. It is an extent of an R1, not a buffer zone leading to another zone type. It should stay R1. John has told us, um, we have had lots of meetings. Um, I was not at the first meeting, but I was at the other meetings, just getting um, questions answered and going through the dialogue. Um, so we have been through a lot of different scenarios of this, where it was gonna be R4, um, John had also told us at numerous meetings that he wanted this to be a gated community um, where there would be a gate right off of 27th Street when you were going into the development. Um, I didn't hear that stated at this meeting and I didn't see it on the presentation, but that's what he has, he has said. Um, and then an, a gate going completely around the whole entire surrounding. So in my backyard there would be a fence um, on his property or on that property, I get it. Um, John has told us that his intent for this area is to be a gated community and having an HOA. As it stands today, HOA is not enforceable to, by the city, so in essence, it's just a word that is thrown around to sound great. We have had many neighborhood meetings with the developer, and he said numerous times that he'll provide us with a copy of the HOA, and we have yet to see it. It is also my understanding that the developer is to have an example of the HOA to present to the city planning for you to vote on, and also before the city council so they know what they are approving. The only action to be taken to uphold an HOA if someone is renting out, a good scenario, if someone buys a twin villa and rents it out, and in their HOA, we discuss this, in their HOA it says no rental. The only way to do anything about that is to take legal civil suit against the person who is renting it out. So all the other people who don't want to have a whole bunch of renters around them, that's their only option, is to take a civil suit. I don't know a lot of people in North Dakota that would actually choose that option. You would just stomach it and eat it. 
The neighbors of 27th Street want this development to stay in R1 zoning. I also want to talk a little bit about the traffic study that was done in 2013. Um, a lot has changed since 2013 on 27th Street because Eagles Landing has, a, has expanded tons, so we have a lot of traffic up and down that street. I also want to talk about, they did not mention this part. Um, this is from Minot City website. Um, it's the proof of 19th Avenue access closing to the bypass once the, the bypass project is finished. 19th Avenue is where a lot of people that live in Eagles Landing access the bypass to get around instead of coming down 27th. At the time when 19th Street, 19th Avenue closes, that will force all of the traffic to come down 27th or they could go over to Sunset and up. But most of them aren't going to take that road over and up because it's a gravel road. They would come down 27th Street. So that part right there affects traffic huge. And that has not been addressed in the traffic study because that was in 2013. Um, that's everything. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. I've been at this for a long time. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak in opposition to this application? Anybody else that would like to speak in opposition? With that, I will we'll take you first, sir, and then, and then we'll take the applicant. Uh, I didn't uh, plan on speaking tonight, but I have a few things to say. My name is Kevin Benes, 709 27th Street. Um, Miss By stated that uh, she didn't want to go into the history of this whole thing because we want to start fresh or whatever, but I think we need to go into the history a little bit. Um, back in June of, 12, uh, of 2012, this when this started, and, and the developers had a, had a nice little meeting for us up at the Grand International and tried to give us a nice little pre presentation of how this, back then it was an R4 uh, planned residence district which I don't see a lot of difference between that and a PUD. Apparently the term PUD hadn't been used yet, but same difference to me. Um, back then they said, by the way, this was a developer from Minneapolis, and right after the flood they came, like a lot of them did. And uh, they said they wanted this to be a community like Minneapolis. They were gonna have small lots because people don't like big yards because then they have to mow grass. I kind of disagree with that. Um, they also said our streets were too wide. That's what makes people go too fast, is the streets were too wide. So anyway, through all this, we got signatures, all this stuff, came to planning. Planning said no. They had a no vote on it. We were told if it doesn't pass, pass planning, there's no way it's going to pass at city council. Well, guess what? We were the lucky ones. It passed in city council the next meeting. So I guess that's the history of the mistrust of this whole thing. And I realize it wasn't these specific people. Well, some were involved at that time, but it's been through a couple different hands as I, as I recall. But it kinda, it's kind of one of those things. And then after it, we decided, well, it's going to be developed, and city council approved it as R1, we kind of, as a, as a neighborhood, said, you know what? Maybe we'll get some nice families down there. We are a close knit neighborhood right now. We'll welcome them in. That's fine. Well, this is at least, I believe it's at least the third, maybe the fourth time we've come back doing all this stuff over again as different variations of a PUD, R4, R2, whatever you want to call it. After R1, in our minds, was a compromise that we could live with. I think it should stay that way. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, commissioners, any questions? Anybody else like to speak in opposition? My name is uh, Jonathan Cornejo. I live in 713 27th Street Northwest. And then I just, um, I'm new to this homeowner stuff over here in Minot. I'm originally from LA. And in LA, we have neighbors on your side, on your back, and there's always problems. So on the lot that we bought, just bought, if this is, goes through with um, two, two townhomes and one single, I'm gonna deal with five neighbors behind me. The other thing is, um, I keep hearing this, where the, um, we're going after the 50 plus people, snowbirds. 
that I know of, the snowbirds that I have met here, I have never seen them own a five-bedroom house. So why is that not being focused on? I just, you know, I, I mean, that's just my concern. What snowbird owns a five-bedroom house? So, I mean, I, if we could clarify that, that, that would be great, you know. So. Yeah, absolutely, thank you for your comments. Co commissioners, any questions for you? Uh, yes. Please come forward. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, uh, commissioners, I just wanted to address a couple of points there. Uh, starting with the, the last gentleman's point, um, our feeling, and we've done some initial marketing, working with some local realtors and such, is that there can be the demand for that high-end product that has family that visits and such and has the means for a bigger house. Um, if you noted the twin villas, which have been redesigned where everything's on the main floor to you know, accommodate that 50 and older crowd or everybody that likes to have the master and everything on the main uh, is, is a smaller you know, product in the end. Obviously, it's a twin villa. So part of our, our proposition here is that we try to create, as Donna described, guardrails um, and clarity in what can be developed there. But ultimately, it's the market that's going to decide uh, within those general guardrails and design requirements how the, de how the development evolves. I couldn't tell you the first lot that's going to get, get developed, but what we do want to, what we do, what we promise to do, and this kind of gets to the point of the early problems, and we're trying to be cognizant of what the neighborhood went through. Donna re referenced the Eagles Landing chaos, and we're trying to create uh, a methodical build out of this and try to keep an open line of communications with the neighbors. I can tell you as soon as we know something about what would be first, uh, if this proposal were to be approved and we could really get going at starting to develop North Ridge, the neighbors are going to know it too. They're going to they're know what lot's going to get ground broken first and such. And I can't, again, repair the damage that was done in those early days that Mr. Vaughn has talked about. Uh, but what we're trying to do is fix it going forward. And we're also trying going forward, uh, ir you know, in a sense, acknowledging that past, but again, getting back to what toolboxes are available to us, what is the city made available for folks to have some flexibility, to do some creative things, and let the market figure this out if it's going to work or not. Um, as stated by uh, Mr. Lang, if we're having problems selling the twin villas or the, the five bedroom single family, I mean, that's, that's our risk, that's our responsibility. We can't just switch and make, you know, build fourplexes. Uh, it was noted that there aren't any fourplexes around there. There's actually a, a legacy fourplex that's directly across the street from the entrance of North Ridge. So and we're obviously not allowed to do that, but you know, there is some different things that happen during the hodgepodge. I would say days of development and such. Regarding the gated concept, that was something that we did openly talk about with the neighbors when we, were, when we had the neighborhood meetings. And subsequent conversations and feedback from some councilmen, uh, from city staff and such, it's not, a, it's not a concept that fits the city right now. Um, could it at some future point? Might it be Northridge? Might it be something else? Possibly. So we have tabled that, um, and it's not included. But we do certainly reserve the right. Um, and you've seen, uh, I think we provided to the neighbors and then Hopefully you've seen too the type of uh, you know perimeter fencing we plan there, which is decorative. It's open. If you look at a lot of the uh, the houses that are up there right now, they're solid six foot fences and such. We're just trying to create some definition of the neighborhood with the perimeter fence that was referenced a little bit earlier. Um, and then uh, the last thing I'd make a comment on, um, and I think that one, one thing we're trying to drive home is that we can only build the twin villas or the single families. And uh, just to put it into context, I had one of uh, the neighbors who came to the first meeting, they lived directly across the street from the entrance to North Ridge, uh, had expressed support at that meeting uh, for the project, for the PUD, for the, the mix of, of development. And when we reached out to them last week just to kind of reconfirm that support, um, I received an email back saying, we have no problem with the mix of single family homes and twin villas. Um, because what, what had happened was, is they'd indicated they signed the protest petition. So we just said, we had, this is from the neighbor, we have no problem with the mix of single family homes or twin villas. The HOA plan sounds good and should keep that area in good shape, therefore keeping property values up. However, we were told that if the twin villas don't sell, you can go ahead and build apartment buildings. Now we had 49 people, uh, roughly I think, sign individuals, and that includes couples on separate lines, sign the petitions, that, uh, the protest petitions in front of you. As Donna mentioned, we've identified 10 of the people that signed in our sign-in sheets on those three meetings that signed those protest sheets. There were other people that attended the meetings that did not sign the protest sheets. Um, this couple here, I spoke to them today, uh, explained the situation, made, the, made it clear to them, as city staff has, that we can only build a single family or twin villas 
uh, when they heard that, they, they'd asked for their names to be removed from the protest petition and offered their full support for the project. So that's just one example of, of where we think the message might have gotten a little mixed out there. And our hope here was to clarify what those tight guardrails are and what we can and can't do with the project. So, Donna, did you have anything else to add? Uh, any, Mr. Chairman, any questions? Or just Not for me, no. Okay. Thank you. Yep, just one, one final comment. Yep. I was one of the girls that walked around and got the uh, signatures on the petition. Um, when we did that, we actually asked the city who all received the petition, and we only had two that did not sign. Um, they all got the certified letter from the city, and the first actual certified letter that came to all of us was the not correct map, which is actually what we were told. Sorry, I don't want to get personal. We were told that um, the reason they pulled it from last meeting was because we had received a different um, map than city planning had. And I verified that with Todd Coop and um, Randy Barch had a different uh, certified letter than the rest of us got in the mailing. In the mailing. So I just wanted to clarify that we only did not get two signatures on this based on a certified letter that came from the city that was an incorrect map. So I just wanted to clarify, since I was one of those that walked around and did that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Very, very quick, yep. My name is Steve Schmaltz. I'm at 2705, so that's my wife that he's been referring to. She's out of town, so she couldn't be here, but I just don't want you to get misled by this Greenway. We heard all about the Greenway the first time around, and right now you go out there and look, and even look on their property, the leafy spurge and everything else, the noxious weeds that are growing there. So, I mean, don't get misled by this, and the gated part, now John said we're going to table it. That doesn't mean it's going away. So if it's going to be public, I was going to be public so that I can access that when it's gated, unless they're going to give me the code to get in the gate so I can go down. And I didn't see any sidewalk on the drawing either. So my comments. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> any other brief comments? With that, I'll close the public hearing, and I'll turn it over to the commissioners for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve with finding of fact and all recommendations and commission or conditions as presented. Is there a second? Second. That's uh, uh got it. Any comments, commissioners? You I'd like to make a comment, if I may. Please, Ms. Carpenko. So I certainly appreciate and understand um, the not in my backyard things when you buy your homes and things are not developed there. I would just like for people to understand that. This is a, a tool in the toolbox that is um, presented to developers. When you drive around town, um, go right up 16th Street from 11th Avenue Southwest and head south. And as you look to the west, you will see a development developed by Flint Forsberg many, many, many years ago. And that is a, a private development of twin homes. Very nicely done, and those are private roads. And if you look just a block to the south, you will see Cook Drive. And in Cook Drive, you will note that there are many hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of beautiful homes. And they're right abutted next to each other. And they both work perfectly together. 16th Avenue Southwest off of 16th Street, you've got Hunter's Ridge. And Hunter's Ridge just overlooks into Southwest Knolls again with similar properties, I would say, to yours on 27th or, or that Eagles Landing area. So my comment would just be that there are other areas in this community that do have similar situations such as this, and, and those areas do seem to be working just fine. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Carpenko. And final comments, I would say that uh, this, com this commission, this body has um, obligatory duty to the city to uphold the city's ordinance at the same time to hear the, the, the public's concerns. In this case, you have uh, you have both sides. This is an application that meets uh, meets the intent of the um, of the ordinances. At the same time, there's a lot of public outcries. So, just keep that in mind while we're while we're, while we're voting here. So, uh, thank you, commissioners. And with that time, any other comments? If not, we'll call the roll. Okay. Hanson. Yes. Wagnest. Yes. Carpenko. Yes. Wetzler. No. Barch. Larcious. No. And Chairman, neither. Yes. 
simple majority. Uh, the motion passed. On to the next application. Uh, that's application uh, number two. <coughs> Application number two is a uh, rezoning and subdivision for Southeast Ridge Business Park Edition. Um, this is located at 15th Avenue Southeast, a FICE subdivision of a portion of Golden Nugget Edition. Um, with that introduction, I'll turn it over to city staff for their comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, commissioners, this, uh, this project might seem familiar to you because uh, I think in uh, October or something like that, just last year, this property came before you uh, as Southeast Ridge Business Park addition, and it was a little bit different arrangement then. Uh, there was a loop road that uh, went through the subdivision, and there were individual lots that <coughs> were uh, situated around the loop road. This is an industrial uh, zoning and an industrial type of park for, it's intended uh, targeted for uh, like uh, shop condos, if you will, plumbers, uh, HVAC, uh, electricians that have uh, that have their equipment and their people would meet there and they have storage of some of their supplies and, and whatnot. It's M1 zoning, or, or well, it's proposed to be zoned M1. And um, <clears throat> at that time, there were going to be individual lots with individual buildings. And uh, that was uh, recommended for approval by the Planning Commission, the rezoning and the subdivision. And I don't know if it went to council or got pulled, but I think it went to council and then the, the, the owner decided they want to do things differently and the plat was never filed. And so with the plat not being filed, the zoning then did not become effective, but the land use map change did become effective. So now, long story short, back before you is the same property with a little bit different layout. Uh, the land use map has been changed in accordance with the proposed zoning to M1. Uh, the current zoning is is mobile home, uh, manufactured home zoning, zoning MH. And if you looked at the property, uh, you notice that there's a lot of manufactured housing uh, around the, the site to, to the to the north and and extending off to the to the to the west. Uh, but the the major differences with the new subdivision is that. There's a kind of a, a road that comes in and bends to the south and ends in a cul-de-sac, and there's only a, a handful of lots now in the park because the idea is that there could be more than one uh, of these condo shop condos on on any individual lot, and it would be a uh, business owners association that would be set up to uh, manage the stormwater detention cell that's in common to manage any common areas uh, that may need to be agreed upon, although this, the streets will be public streets uh, built to city standards and uh, maintained, by, maintained by the city. There was uh, some issues with, uh, or some discussion, and some things to work out with the utilities for the public works department and, and the engineering department. Uh, several easements were requested and some easements were requested to be uh, enlarged uh, to, to meet requirements for that. Uh, the stormwater management pond is uh, included uh, on one lot that also can have development on it, so it's not a standalone lot, so there's no issues with who's going to maintain it. The, the Business Owners Association will maintain the stormwater management pond. So in terms of uh, findings of fact, the future land use designation for this property is industrial. The subject property is currently zoned MH Residential Manufactured Home District. The adjacent property to the east and southeast is currently zoned M1 and partially developed. The property to the north is zoned MH and contains a large manufactured home, home park. The property to the west is zoned C2 is vacant on the east end, but there are manufactured homes on the west, two-thirds or so of the property. The owner does not wish to pursue residential development of this parcel, rather proposed uses for an industrial subdivision with shop buildings. Therefore, the parcel must be rezoned to accommodate the, the proposed use from MH to M1. 
Given the location of this parcel, tucked away behind a large manufactured home park and bounded by the Suris River along the south and southwest sides, this parcel is not well suited for commercial development, but is appropriate for light industrial development as proposed. A couple other things that come to mind. Um, this, this property is along the river, but it sits high enough that it's out of the floodplain. And because it does border existing residential, even though it's manufactured home residential, there's a 20-foot buffer yard required along those property lines where it would border the residential use. And then the, the last thing that comes to mind is that uh, because there's a cul-de-sac proposed here, there's an emergency outlet to the west that's an existing, that would, would tie into an existing driveway that that would provide police, fire, and emergency responders uh, a second way in and out of the subdivision. So the conditions for this approval, if you so choose, uh, number one, a traffic impact study is required and improvements must be constructed by the developer. Number two, applicant must present to the fire department its plan for the emergency access. Number three, applicant will get approval from Public Works regarding the finalization of utility easements. Number four, stormwater management plan must be submitted to and approved by the city engineer. Storm sewer and pond improvements outside public right away must be owned and operated by the developer or a property owners association. The pond and outfall of Southeast Ridge Business Park Edition must be incorporated into the proposed improvements and agreements for Southeast Ridge Business Park. Second edition, uh, the Southeast Ridge Business Park Edition is directly to the east of Budding, so the, the two ponds need to work together, basically. Number five, elevation certificates are required for parcels within the 100-year floodplain. Buildings must be elevated for city ordinance requirements. Number six, utility connection fees must be paid. Number seven, dumpster enclosures are required with size and location subject to Public Works Department approval. Number eight, a 20-foot wide landscape buffer yard is required by code along the north and west property lines where the abutting use of the zoning district is less intensive, MH, mobile home residential. Number nine, all outdoor security lines shall be sharp cut off downlit fixtures. And the final condition, number 10, Developers' agreement with the city of Minot is required to be approved and recorded prior to the recording of this plan. And uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Mr. Lang? With that, uh, is there somebody that would like to speak on behalf of this application? Good evening, Sean Weeks with Ackerman Asphalt representing the applicant. Um, Thanks for the introduction, Mr. Lang. Well, we're in agreement with all of the conditions that have been set forth in the, by staff. Some of the details relative to uh, stormwater and to utilities will be, uh, we'll handle those with the individual departments, engineering and public works. Um, improvements relative to landscaping, uh, parking, et cetera, will be handled through the site plan review as, as we develop each of the individual lots. So that, that basically concludes my presentation. Um, if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Weeks. Um, basically, it's the same application we saw previously, just a few, a few It few is, remarks, I, correct? yeah, I can speak to that. The, uh, so we've got less supporting infrastructure. It will cost the developer less to do this. Um, he felt he was kind of cornering himself in terms of the, uh, the predefined lot sizes that he had presented earlier. So we'd like a little more. This gives him a little more latitude, he believes, in, in how he's going to develop the, the property. Perfect. Mr. Weeks, uh, just one question on item number eight, the landscaping requirements. On the plat that was provided, um, it shows the roadway coming uh, that, that goes east and west. It appears that roadway is right along the, the northern property line. Um, how do you intend to create that 20-yard buffer um, with, it, with that roadway. Is that roadway final or is this just a preliminary rendering? Well, we know we're going to be working with an 80 foot right of way. Um, we'll have to, I'll have to work out the detail with Mr. Lang. In the event that we come up short with property there, we can augment the 
width of the landscape buffer elsewhere along that line in order to satisfy uh, a complete area of <coughs> coverage that would, would be consistent with a 20-foot strip along the whole, the whole property line. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Wiggs. Any other questions for the applicant? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody that would like to speak in favor of this application? Hearing none, is there anybody that would speak, like to speak in opposition of this application? Hearing none, we'll close the, the public hearing and we'll tur turn it over to the commissioners for a motion, please. Motion to approve with conditions. Second. Motion by Wegness, second by Carpenkow. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll. Hansen? Yes. Wegness? Yes. Carpenko? Yes. Wetzler? Yes. Barch? Larcious. Yes. And neither. Yes. Motion carries. On to agenda item number three. This is an application for a subdivision for Southwest Business Park Edition, a lot 10 of section 34, uh, 155 North 83 West of the 5th P uh, Prime Meridian, the city of Minot, Ward County, North Dakota. Um, with that, Mr. Lang. Comments Sir. from city staff, please. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward uh, commercial proposal in uh, Southwest Minot, uh, down uh, at a pretty prime location at, at 37th and 16th. Um, the property is zone C2 already. Basically, it's just a subdivision that split the existing property up into lots, uh, lots of streets. There's eight proposed lots. Um, there is stormwater management uh, that is uh, not on a standalone lot. And one of the comments uh, in, throughout the development was uh, originally it was on a standalone lot, and that's been uh, made so that it's part of more than one lot now, so that uh, it's a responsibility that, of the owners or the uh, association of owners to maintain the stormwater cell. So. Uh, there is kind of a unique situation with this property. On, uh, on the um, west end where 20th Street Southwest is, is, exists, uh, only half the right-of-way is there at this time, uh, and the, the, that half the right-of-way would be with this developer. So the, the west half is not available, but uh, the city's expectation is that the developer will put the street in, so that probably the most likely situation would be to, do, to request a Pavement, a pavement improvement district, uh, which would then obligate the developer to the west to participate unless they have enough protest rights, which I don't believe they will. So uh, otherwise, the, the street could still be built uh, by uh, developer constructed infrastructure all on this property if that became a, a final uh, option, I, I suppose. But there's also some current or existing development at the north end, northwest corner of this property at the north end some storage units that were built there and they're built too close to the 20th street alignment if you were to extend it north and so a couple of ideas were discussed one uh, uh, a double reverse curve an s curve that would swing out west and then realign far enough over but there doesn't appear to be enough room to really make that happen so more likely there'll be uh, a 90 degree intersection at the north end of this property where 20th street ties into to uh another street that would serve property to the west and to the north. And one of the conditions is you'll see to extend paving with that paving district uh, from uh, 37th Avenue all the way to the north property line and to extend the, uh, the utilities of that. And I, I made a, a, a mistake, I think, in, in that utility statement. I think Donna Bai uh, and I were talking about it earlier. She's going to, to correct me on that one. Uh, but otherwise, uh, it's pretty straightforward commercial development. There's commercial around it. It fits into the neighborhood. The uh, findings of fact, the subject property is currently zoned C2, general commercial district. Adjacent properties are also zoned commercial. The land use map, map designation is general mixed use. Given the location of this parcel, commercial development is the highest to best use. And then conditions. <clears throat> a 
traffic impact studies required, improvements must be constructed by the developer. Stormwater management plan must be submitted to and approved by the city engineer. Storm sewer and pond improvements outside public right away must be owned and operated by the developer or a property owner's association. Number three, 20th Street Southwest to be paved by the developer to the north property line of the property. Number four, sanitary sewer and water main to be extended to the north property line of the development and 20th Street Southwest. I think that's the one that's not correct. Oh, one or the other of the utilities is in there and the, and the other is in another place, so we'll, we'll get that straightened out. Number five, developer's agreement with the city of Minot is required to be approved and recorded prior to recording of this plat. And that's all the conditions. If you have any questions, we'll have Donna clarify that utility question. Here. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Lang. Any questions for Mr. Lang at this time? If not, uh, somebody would like to speak on behalf of the applicant? My name is Donna Bai, so uh, Houston Engineering, thank you for allowing me a, a short presentation for, for this client. Um, just a little background, this large out lot was created in 2008, uh, just under 20 acres. Uh, it's been vacant, farmed for uh, many decades. Uh, most recently it was a, a part of, a, a small portion of it in the southeast corner was used for um, overflow of one of the local car dealerships, so a small gravel patch was parked, uh, was uh, given uh, temporary use um, a few years ago. Um, it's surrounded, uh, as mentioned, completely by commercial properties. Um, this flight was one of our drone flights earlier this spring. So uh, as you can see, uh, some of the snow isn't melted yet, but um, it's bordered by 16th Street, 37th Avenue Southwest. It's near existing retail, grocery stores, hotels, restaurants, the Y, and the future hospital site. Um, this is part of the future land use map. Um, certainly zoning for this district allows for all sorts of types of uses as mentioned in the slide. Um, it is um, an area that's included in the phase one of development, which basically means that um, the utilities are readily available for this site. It's adjacent to city um, development now. It's been annexed and it's ripe for development. Um, some of the potential projects that our client has entertained include a funeral home, an office building, and a bank. Um, utilities and wetland management, uh, currently we have submitted a wetland report to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to identify two wetlands on the site to better understand whether those are core or jurisdictional wetlands. Uh, we should find that out within 30 to 90 days. Uh, at that point, we may need to come back for a mod to modify the plat for a small lot line adjustment within that development, but we don't see that that uh, deterring the development. Um, sanitary sewer, stormwater, potable water main are located in the right-of-ways adjacent to this proposed plat. Uh, stormwater detention pond and drainage are already evaluated and are included in our preliminary plans with our client as we develop the layout of these lots. Traffic impact in this area, um, the joining roadway systems um, will, will show in a traffic analysis that they are uh, able to handle any additional traffic that's created by this development. Um, and the study should be done with the final design. Uh, developer or city coordination, uh, obviously was required landscaping and sidewalks will be included along the street per those city landscape chapter. Uh, with plans submitted for individual lots, uh, just according to the city staff as those lots are sold and building permits are requested. Uh, there was an additional 20 feet of right of way dedicated for future turn lanes um, along, the right, along the roadways. Uh, our schedule for utilities really is simple. Um, the construction of the underground utilities we hope to get done later this fall with curb gutter, pavement lighting, sidewalks next spring. Sidewalks again coming uh, really at the end of the development of each individual plat as a final um, prior to uh, certificate of occupancy. And with that, I promised I'd keep it short and we're here for any questions. Both of our, our owners are also in the audience. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Bai. Any questions for the applicant? Hearing none, would anybody else like to speak uh, on behalf or in favor of this application? Seeing none, would anybody like to speak in opposition to this application? Mr. Chairman, do we need to get clarification on that, what I perceive as a yes. conflict on that condition? Yes, Mr. Lang. Yeah. Condition number four, is that correct? Uh, Donna. <laughs> Condition number four says sanitary sewer water main to be extended to the north property line of the development on 20th Street Southwest. In speaking with the city engineer, Mr. Lang, um, 
that sanitary sewer um, would stop. I believe Lance, correct me if I'm wrong. We're gonna go, I'm gonna actually go to a map. Let's see here. Nancy, how do I get this reduced down? Back to our map, or the city has a map. Oops. You have a map on your presentation? Okay. Let's go back to number three for a second. 20th Street Southwest to be paved by the developer 95 feet south of the north property line, or in other words, the north property line of Highlander Estates, lot three, I believe, just prior to the design and development of that, quote, either T or curved intersection, and that the sanitary sewer for the, uh, is potentially coming off of 35th Avenue Southwest, so it will be extent, depending on how the stormwater plans are reviewed and approved by the engineering department, will depend on where um, that sanitary sewer comes from and what uh, utilities need to be extended. I so get a nod. So this time you're comfortable with both conditions being in there? Um, we are. I believe the, the ownership is as well. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions, Commissioners? With that, I'll close the uh, comment period and we'll turn it over to the Commissioners for a motion, please. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'd make a motion to approve the request based on a finding of facts and the five conditions recommended by staff. Perfect. I'll second. Okay. Motion by Wegnest. Uh, you got a second by Larsha. Motion by Wetzler. Oh, darn it. I apologize about that. Uh -huh. Call the roll, please. Barch? Yes. Hansen? Yes. Karpenko? Yes. Larshus? Yes. Uh, Wagnus? Yes. Wetzler? Yes. And neither? Yes. Motion carries. On to the next application. Next application is Statesboro Edition, Lot 5, Lots. 3A through 9B, 12A through 12B. This is a public hearing on a request by Bakken Development Group, uh, LLC, re represented by Raleigh Ackerman, for planned unit development review to construct duplexes on Statesboro Edition, Lot 5, Lots 3A, 9B, and 12A through 14B. The property is located at uh, 3200 and 3400 block of 15th Street Northwest. And with that, Mr. Lang, uh, we'll hear staff's recommendation. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is part of the, what was called the Statesboro uh, Edition Development. It's uh, zoned R4, which is a defunct zoning district now, but it's zoned that way, and so it, it remains R4. R4 was a precursor of PUD, and so when this came through back uh, in the original approval, there was a, a concept to put uh, duplexes on, 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 on narrow lots, and if I understand correctly, at that time, there were some var uh, variances that were requested for yards and whatnot and uh, so then the, the project was approved and uh, eight townhouse units were constructed and uh, I think two more basements were excavated and then the slow times hit uh, the hard times with the oil field and flood and whatever happened so the project's kind of been, <coughs> been, been sitting there and one of the original investors not all the original investors are involved is my understanding but one of them has kind of taken the lead to uh, to work with this development and, and move it forward and actually uh, working with the city and with the larger picture of not only this particular area but some of the surrounding land to come up with a better master plan as we move forward but the, the first steps and as we look at the bigger picture is to kind of resolve what's going on with this situation and uh, the development teams come up with two alternative uh, duplex units that they feel may be more marketable than what the original ones were. And since this is an R4, which is basically the same as a PUD, the, the commitment to build the units that were originally established was originally approved was there. So they're, they're asking permission to introduce uh, these two new variations and get approval from the Planning Commission. Uh, perhaps staff could have said administratively, a duplex is a duplex, so go ahead and do it. But we felt 
that it would be proper to bring it back to the Planning Commission, uh, since it is an R4 zoning, to have the, the applicant present the, the two units to you. Uh, these particular units will not require any variances. Uh, they'll fit on the lots uh, within the zoning, and they won't, don't, don't require any change in zoning or anything. It's basically just uh, two new unit types. The elevations are included in your packet to show the architectural character and uh, perhaps the uh, applicant can explain a little bit more about proposed construction materials and, and timing and some of the other things. But in terms of uh, the staff's findings of facts, if I can find where I need to be here. <clears throat> Uh, the future land use designation for this area is medium density residential. The subject properties are currently zoned R4, a defunct zone similar in nature to a PUD. Townhomes are an allowable use in this district. At the time this property was originally developed, townhomes were constructed on eight lots. I kept saying duplexes, but I'm sorry, townhomes. The developer would now like to propose a modified unit type different from the original units. Planning Commission must review and take action on this proposal. And staff is working with the developer on a master plan for a much larger area than that included in this in this property. And uh, as a recommendation, staff is recommending approval of these revised townhome units as presented. There's no no conditions attached to that. So if you have any questions for me, I'd be glad to answer them. Perfect. Let me clarify item number four to request a change in unit type. I believe I read the wrong, wrong description. My apologies, commissioners. Um, with that, um, I think we'll open it up for a comments. Um, and who would like to speak on behalf of, of this application? Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Commission. Raleigh Ackerman, Ackerman Surveying Associates. Uh, the, the purpose of this uh, request is, is simply change to the unit type that was, that was originally proposed. And in an R4 zone, uh, that would require uh, reappearance on the owner's behalf. Um, this property is the property that's located just south of the New Ramstead um, School. And um, obviously the way it was platted before, we had, you know, the owner had issues uh, with what was going on up there. And those being that it required uh, variances on the property. And he has reconfigured the, um, the units uh, so that there are no variances required uh, whatsoever. Um, the units on uh, west of 15th Street are all single story units. And the units north of 15th uh, Street Northwest are actually a two story unit. So this is simply, um, you know, the property lines didn't change, the zoning didn't change, simply <coughs> the unit type um, changed. And um, it does fit the, uh, uh, the fronts of the uh, units that are existing currently, so they do fit. Uh, within the uh, within the neighborhood of the units that are there currently, uh, the developer also has shown or is taking um, uh, steps to be a positive influence in Minot. Uh, he has been here uh, a number of different times, uh, meeting with uh, city staff. Uh, we've had a numerous meetings, I guess, with city staff, and also uh, are planning um, uh, a new master plan. For the entire uh, piece east of, of this whole uh, this whole unit, so this is just the first piece of the puzzle. This and the next item that's on the agenda. So, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to, to answer those. Any questions for Mr. Ackerman? Go ahead, Ms. Burke. Please, thank, thank you. Hi. Um, so, with the PUD, I mean, I understand that R4 is going away, and PUD is becoming the next um, zone for this. A couple of things that. I'm just curious about, so within this now, we've talked at length about PUDs creating a unique and a special kind of environment or a look, and then also committing, you know, just some different public access or park-like activities for the, the units there. With there only being a couple different structure types, I guess, has there been any consideration for varying those because as we've held the very first PUD to account, we required them to change just from having two structures to making it very uniquely different? Uh, the, the zoning 
um, as currently is. It's actually an, an R4. And under, the, under that zoning, um, there was uh, amenities that were agreed upon. Right. And those amenities will still be in place. As far as the unit type, um, they will be changing the configuration being with color and siding and, and so on. But they're um, all front load garage here. They're, they, in and this so case, they all, you look down in, in the road this, and yes. it's all the same. Um, in, in this case, uh, they are since the infrastructure is already in place. Okay. So we're kind of stuck with what we're stuck with, um, unfortunately. But uh, we're building on what was existing and what utilities were in place. So our footprint has to pretty much remain the same. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Seeing none, uh, would anybody else like to speak in favor of this application? Seeing none, would anybody like to speak in opposition of this application? Okay. Seeing none, I'll turn it over to the commissioners for a motion, please. Motion to approve. Motion okay. by Wagnest. Mm -hmm. Second by Karpanko. Any discussion, commissioners? If there's no discussion, go ahead and take the roll. Barch? Yes. Hansen? Yes. Karpanko? Larshus? Yes. Wagnus? Yes. Wetzler? Yes. Chairman Neither? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next application now, we're on to item number five uh, the rezoning and subdivision of Statesboro Second Edition, Block 6, Lot 1A through 9B, Statesboro Edition. Um, this is an application by Bakken Development Group, Minot 1 LLC, represented by Raleigh Ackerman and Ackerman Espo. Anybody like to speak on? I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, city staff. Take it away. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a rezoning, and it's right in the same neighborhood as the last item we talked about, uh, uh, exactly across the street, even. Uh, 15th Street Northwest, as we stated earlier, was uh, the street was installed, and the original concept was based on R4 and it had these uh, townhomes that were uh, platted throughout the area. And <coughs> again, <coughs> the, the owner, and the developer, and the, the development team, there was a vision to try and uh, diversify uh, a little bit from maybe what that original concept was, as Commissioner Compico also recognized maybe would be advantageous. And so the idea is to develop R1 single family housing on the east side of 15th Street Northwest, where on the west side, you just approved the, uh, the modified townhomes. And um, our hands are tied to some degree, as, as uh, Mr. Ackerman stated, because the streets are in and we don't have a lot of wiggle room, so to speak. But uh, the original lots that were laid out were 30 foot lots for the townhomes. And by combining the two uh, to make each two lots into a 60 foot lot, we get a large enough lot to meet the R1S zoning uh, category, the zoning district, which is a single family uh, zoning district with small lot flexibility. And so the, the minimum lot width is, is 60 feet. This is a new zoning category that uh, was adopted in 2013 with the code revisions. And it hasn't been used anywhere else in town. And I don't know that this is really the intended way that it's going to be used, but it does provide a, a way to to uh, depart from all of these uh, uh, townhomes on such small lots and it provides some single families that will be on smaller lots in terms of single family uh, scenario, but will provide uh, an excellent opportunity for First, home, first time home buyers and a more affordable unit than being a smaller unit. So basically the proposal before you is to rezone from R4 to R1S and then the replatting uh, of the subdivision in states for a second edition where they combine those existing lots, uh, each two into one, and provide instead of 18 uh, individual units as townhome, or twin townhome units, it would provide for nine single family uh, homes on those lots. So the findings of fact, the future land use designation is in a medium density residential. The 
the subject properties are currently zoned R4 a default zone similar in nature to a PUD. If the property is rezoned to R1S, single family homes are permitted use in this district. At the time this property was originally developed, twin homes were planned for these lots and they were subdivided accordingly. The developer would now like to propose single family housing as opposed to townhomes. The existing lots can be combined and replanted to meet R1S standards. Staff is working with the developer on a master plan for a much larger area that includes this property. So again, these two, the item before this one and this one are, are kind of steps to keep, to kickstart this development again. There are plans to do some other things that uh, hopefully will be desirable and will be coming to you in the future. There's only one recommendation associated with this uh, request and that is because the streets are in and the sanitary and water service lines are in and they were put in based on the 30 foot spacing of the lots and now there will be half as many units. And um, so Public Works and Engineering have uh, have asked that uh, the sanitary sewer water service lines that are to be abandoned must be removed back to the main and properly capped. Affected street sections must then be patched to match existing sections when replaced. So with that, uh, do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Lang. Any questions for city staff? Uh, would anybody like to speak on behalf of this application? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as uh, Director Lang, or Planner and Director Lang um, had commented concerning the um, uh, the units are directly to the east of the ones we just just visited about. So probably to further answer uh, uh, questions about uh, uh, mixed use, um, the property will be zoned into an R1 um, to R1S zoning um, to allow smaller residential lots um, in the master plan um, will be surrounded by R2 along the north uh, north side and the property just to the east of these will also be zoned R1S in the master plan. There will be amenities uh, planned uh, that they signed for in the original documents and um, by the end of the summer uh, that master plan will be brought to you and, and planning director Davis and staff as well. They've seen it and uh, we will be working with them as well. Um, we have been working with uh, engineering and, and uh, about the uh, service connections that we have no problem with the recommendation. Any comments or any questions for the applicant? If not, would anybody else like to speak in favor of this application? Would anybody like to speak in opposition of this application? Okay. Uh, Mr. Ackerman, I did have one question. Sorry, I was looking down. No, I've got to read my, read my notes quicker. Um, what kind of setbacks can we expect, side yard set setbacks in between these um, units? These, these will all be um, um, uh, the standard six and a half they on the sides. Okay. And 25 in the front. They meet all the, there's no they variances do. required. They do, okay. Yeah. Um, one other question. I did hear from one other individual in this area, and it was with respect to uh, weeds and stuff like that. Right. Um, I wanted to bring it to the attention of the applicant that uh, it, it has been brought up. Yes. Um, and, and when we uh, we met with planning um, with the developer, uh, his plan is is that he has uh, someone under contract for maintenance this year. Okay. Uh, they plan on finishing uh, all the uh, undone unfinished uh, business out there uh, this summer yet. Okay. Perfect. Matter of fact, they're working on it right now. They have Warner Construction up there working on it. Perfect. It's tough to make that so. a condition of this application because it's such a small part of the entire development, but I thought I'd bring it to your attention. Yes, he, okay. he's aware of it and city staff has brought it up and he has someone under contract doing that as we speak. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, with that, I'll close the public hearing and uh, I'll turn it over to the commissioners for a motion, please. Any discussion, commissioners? Any discussion on this application? If not call the roll. Barch. Yes. Hanson. Yes. Carpenko. Yes. Larshus. Yes. Wagnist. Yes. Wetzler. Yes. Chairman Neither. Yes. Motion carries.
application is approved. Um, on to our next item, item number six. This is a uh, application by uh, Minot Area Development Corporation um, to uh, rezone um, from AG to uh, AG M1 and M2 into uh, our new uh, multiple new districts, including I1 and I2. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Lang for city's comments, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> this is a rezoning um, and to uh, propose zones that are actually new, as the chairman stated, uh, I haven't been working here that long, but I know that uh, the development council and uh, the city and various players have been working uh, on uh, this industrial park north of County Road 12 and um, on the east and west sides of 42nd Street Southeast. Uh, MADC owns a lot of that property and then AGT Foods is out there. They've been working on this for a number of years and there's been a lot of ideas kicked around. At one point, uh, you know, M1 and M2 zones that are existing in industrial were gonna perhaps be modified, but in the long run, it was decided that in order to attract the, uh, the proper types of uh, businesses that we foresee complementing AGT Foods, in an agribusiness park, uh, maybe some energy related uh, type focus, uh, but to have a more targeted uh, um, um, ordinance, we've, we've created uh, these two new zoning districts and they're actually gonna be on the next agenda item. We're gonna talk about the, the zoning districts themselves, but the property that's up for rezoning in this application is owned by, uh, by MADC and then also AGT is part of it. and. It's all zoned um, <clears throat> industrial already, but it's M1 or M2, except for one outlaw that's zoned back. <clears throat> and uh, that, th all those properties are proposed to be zoned either I1 or I2. The, the premise of the, of the proposed park is that it would be ringed by I1, which is a lighter industrial proposal along the road, the, the public roads outside, but then with, within the I1 zoning in the heart of the industrial park, it would be I2, which would be a heavy industrial zoning and have internal circulation and whatnot within it. And so most of the lots, or most of the land that's proposed here for rezoning is proposed for I-2. Uh, there's very little I-1, and there's actually a correction that I need to know, because in your <coughs> recommendation, <coughs> I'm losing my voice. <coughs> in your recommendation, we need to make sure that we get this right. Uh, <coughs> the very first, uh, the very first one, uh, property listed is says from ag agricultural to i1 light industrial park it should be i2 property described as outlaw 2 of the northwest quarter of the southwest quarter of section 17-155-82 so <clears throat> we have the legal description right but the uh, rezoning needs to be modified from the i1 that's listed to i2 all the rest of them are correct from M1 to, to I1, there's a, a little bit, and most of it is from M1 to I2 or M2 to I2. And um, this will set up this area in, in coordination with the adoption of the new zoning districts to uh, market this. Uh, one of the unique parts of, the, of, of this area and this property in particular is that it does have rail access. And BNSF is, uh, is open to uh, marketing and and, uh, and 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 that's a good thing in some communities they want to shut down all the spurs and just run the main line so we have an opportunity here to attract rail traffic which is a great thing so with that being said uh, oh, let me read the findings of fact <coughs> the future land use map designates this area as industrial the proposed rezoning to I-1 and I-2 zoning districts will be in conformance with the plan and then recommendations. Uh, staff recommends approval of the industrial tracks as listed below. So the very first one needs to be changed from AG to I2 instead of from AG to I1. And then the rest of it is all correct. Thank you, Mr. Lang. Um, just one quick uh, question for city staff. Did the notifications that got sent out to the surrounding property owners go all correct in that that very first uh, bullet point from A to I2, was that settled correctly? Did you just typo in our, in our, uh, our packet? Or? It would have been sent out the way that it reads here. The way that it reads here, so it does say from A to I1? Okay, um, I guess I'll have to hear from our city attorney as far as uh, 
get some not grabbing no notifications and stuff like that if you could just walk me through that please. Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission, there are notice requirements for tax amendments or zoning district changes. I assume those were sent out, but since there was a typo in them, there probably should be a corrected okay. notice then. So, um, Kelly, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, would it be proper to um, withhold that first one then? Would that be the correct uh, legal way to proceed, or can we, can we vote on it? On approval to no problem, and I, that probably would be the best thing. Hold the item, Mr. Chairman. Okay. The group or the notice has to be sent out before the item um, is decided. Commissioners, please keep that in mind as you're making your motion. Um, with that, is there anybody that would like to speak on behalf of the applicant? Jim Montgomery. Uh, Minot Area Development Corporation, 2709 Brookside Drive, Minot. Um, this has been a long process, and we'd like to avoid delaying it further. Uh, so whatever we can do legally to correct the mistake and keep going. But the reason we're doing this is, to, is we're working with the BN to become what's called site certified. We'll be one of a very few sites in the nation that is pre-certified by the railroad and it will help us attract uh, larger develop, uh, developments, uh, mainly because the BN will be doing a lot of advertising and we'll, be, we'll have a special relationship with them. So I think it's whatever we can do to uh, keep this on track, pardon the pun, but uh, we're, we're ready to go and, and we'd like to keep on track. Sure. Um, with that comment, I might interject. Can somebody on the staff um, maybe enlighten us as far as the notification process and how many days are out um, to the chair? Do you, I, I believe it's 11 days before the meeting. Is that correct, Kelly? Um, Mr. Chairman, what the ordinance states is that notice has to be in the newspaper and then the same notice has to be sent by certified mail, not later than the date of publication of such notice. So that would be approximately 11 days. It's seven days that it has to be, in seven days prior it has to be in the newspaper. And then they have to get it at the same time. Try to remedy this, sir, as soon as That was can. prior to this hearing. Okay. All right. Okay, any questions or? Questions for the applicants? Okay, thank you. Anybody that would like to uh, speak in favor of this application? Is there anybody that would like to speak in opposition of this application? Nothing in mind. Uh, seeing nothing, we'll, uh, we'll close the public hearing and turn it over to commissioners for a motion. I can make a motion, and if city attorney will make sure that um, how I present this is correct. So um, make a motion to approve the item, but holding item one where egg turns into I1 because that's going to be I2, is that correct? So holding that particular piece of this item, moving the, follow, moving the rest of the items and making that contingent upon city council approving the next order of business number seven, the zoning ordinance changes because I1 and I2 are not yet approved. Second. I'll second, can you read it back for clarification? <laughs> Me to say it again, Bob, as best I can. Well, you got it, Kelly. Okay. So, moving to approve everything, holding the first item, A to <coughs> I1, because it's incorrect, should be I2. Everything else will go forward. And then it's contingent on council approving our item number seven, which is implementing the new zone of I1 or I1 and I2. Gotcha. Wait for the second. <laughs> Thank you. Um, discussion. I did have one uh, item I, I thought of. Um, city staff, um, as we work through this master plan of this entire community at that time, um, 
the DOT and his recommendations as far as curbing lanes and stuff like that. Um, has, has a traffic study been, been uh, started or, or completed and been proposed for this parcel yet as far as traffic goes? Will that come during the master plan process? There is a completed traffic study that okay. was done, and we've asked engineering to take a look at it. Okay. They've also uh, taken a look at the transportation 2035 plan. And uh, are looking at the road classification network and making sure that it's consistent with what we're proposing as as the initial part of the master planning process. Thank you. And also, as uh, uh, Commissioner Pankow mentioned, this item, uh, the next item will, will be in front of us and for the I two and I one districts, it will go to the city council, and uh, then upon approval there. Call the roll, please. Barch? Yes. Hansen? Yes. Carpenko? Yes. Larshus? Yes. Wagness? Yes. Wetzler? Yes. Chairman Neither. Yes. Motion carried. Uh, item number seven on our agenda is that of the I-1 and I-2 uh, districts, that being the light industrial park district, uh, changes to the heavy industrial park district, and a few changes to the, the uh, C3 central business district. That, I'll take from the city staff, yes, sir. Uh, the I-1 light industrial and I-2 heavy industrial uh, industrial park districts, I should you say, are um, the, the two new chapters that we're referring to. We spent a lot of time working with the zoning ordinance steering committee, uh, hashing out all the, de the details that go along with the, with the zoning district, including the what uses should be allowed, which ones should be conditional or interim, which ones should be prohibited. Uh, again, with the idea of we, we really have a focus on the type of industry, working with the railway, working with the, uh, the emphasis on agribusiness and, and agriculture, and the opportunity we have with energy to uh, tailor these districts for that, for those types of uses. We also have standards in there uh, for parking uh, based on use type. Um, I mean, most of it's pretty typical industrial type of application, manufacturing, uh, distribution, warehousing, and, and some of those things. And uh, we used uh, the parking generation standards for those types of uses from uh, our research of other ordinances that I think were on target there. Um, there is some direction in terms of minimum landscaping. Uh, some minimum screening, you know, this is going to be a big industrial area, so uh, <coughs> it's not going to be a place where, you know, the, it, things are going to uh, be real easy to, to, to pretty up, you know, it's going to be what it is, but there is an opportunity to do some of that, and so we have some <coughs> minimal landscaping and, and uh, uh, screening standards and some discussion about uh, the buildings and, and whatnot. Um, I don't know if you want to go through it, like, item by item or how you want to do it or if you want to add on to what I said and what did I just say thing? Is there just some general comments about some of the changes that were from the M1 and M2 to the M1 and I2? If not, that would be taking up. I think all the commissioners have read through the full the full um, the, the essence of, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, the essence of this is to create a industrial cluster that would be centered around value-added agriculture and or energy. So the ideal is to provide uh, uses where the input of one use would, would uh, be turned into the output of another. So you would group various value-added industries together and in the business-like or, or um, industrial park type of setting, which would differ from what we would, uh, what we could do with an M1 and M2, and, and as, as uh, Mr. Lang suggested, because of the nature of the value-added agriculture, there would be some consideration for the reduction of certain landscaping requirements, as uh, we have found that those tend to contradict the uh, or create practical difficulties for uh, for ag agricultural. Uh, value-added agricultural uses. So the, the intent here was to create uh, an industrial park that would 
create, uh, well, the anchor would be some type of value-added agriculture with, with the value chain that would be within close proximity to the um, anchors to create synergy and reduce costs for, for the businesses. And, and, that, and that's also the, another big feature is the fact that this is uh, intended to be a logistical park. So where the focus would be on logistics and distribution, and again, cost savings related to uh, to that aspect of it. Thank you very much for your comments. Would anybody like to speak and, and I guess in favor for this uh, agenda? Hi, hi, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Raleigh Ackerman. Um, obviously, I was on the, the steering committee. Um, the steering committee met four or five times. Uh, oh, at, at least the, at least the, the first four, meeting we five. got through a page and a half. You can believe that I'm going. Wow, what's this is going to take some some time, but uh, the people that, that uh, we asked also to join us were the the building committee, the con the contractors, um, and uh, they were there also. Uh, MADC uh, had staff there, so it was a combination of the steering committee, uh, uh, at least two or three of the builders, and MADC. Uh, I say that folks as well as the steering committee. So we had a good effort in, in doing this. We started with a big, with a big document and uh, we uh, went through it item by item and I think we have a good document. So I'd certainly recommend you, you approving it. Any questions? Not a question, just a comment. Uh, just to thank Raleigh and, and your entire steering committee. I know that having participated in that process in 2012 and before we did the 2013 changes. It's an enormous process and to volunteer all of your time is amazing and appreciated, so thank you. Well, we're, we're getting through there, we're, we're, we're getting there. It's good, I, thank I, you. I told you that we'd be back and we'd be back <laughs> many times and I'm sure that we're, we still have items to, to talk about, so. I, I believe it's even coming yet on the C. I just don't think people understand the enormity of, of work that goes into that, so thank you. Okay. Um, would anybody like to speak in opposition to this agenda item? Okay. With that, uh, I'll look for a motion, Commissioner, please. Do we want to do the one in front of each one? Each. Okay. Each. Do you want to work each one separately? Yeah. Go ahead. The M3. Yeah. Okay. So I guess. Um, we can. It's okay. Do So I guess I'm going to make the motion. Yeah. <laughs> make the motion to approve all uh, zoning ordinance updates. I'll second. C3, which is the Central Business District downtown, um, places of assembly, quote unquote, uh, use type places of assembly, which would include uh, uh, places of worship, churches, uh, are not allowed for some reason in C3 after the rewrite of 2013. And uh, we feel like that was an oversight and most likely happened. Uh, a lot of times in ordinances, it'll say, in a zoning district, any use per, that was allowed for, let's say, in C1 is also allowed in C2, along with more uses. Any use in C3 is allowed in, in, in the next district, along with more uses. And so uh, I think that statement was taken out of C3, where it used to say any, any use allowed in C2 is also allowed in C3, but it kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater because you know, there were some things that were in C2 that, that may certainly be appropriate in C3 that got lost. And I don't know for a fact that that's what happened, but the end of the story is that for some reason churches aren't allowed in the current ordinance in the downtown district. And as you know, there's three or four or five or six of them down there. Um, and uh, so we would like to correct that and add places assembly back into the C3 district as a permitted use. And then the last thing is, uh, also in the C3 Central Business District, some of the business owners like to, uh, in, during the nice time of the year in the, in the spring and summer, have uh, outdoor dining areas or outdoor, outdoor uh, a patio type situation. So there could be tables and chairs out on the walk uh, for people to sit outside when it's nice. And we did have 
uh, in the past there was language in the ordinance that uh, allowed that, but uh, after reviewing the, that uh, language, there was a revision proposed, and uh, the uh, the ordinance was uh, approved by by city council. But then we realized there's a conflict where there was there was language and zoning that talked about it, and then this newly approved state of the art, you know, the newest greatest thing that had gone through council. There's a conflict. So basically. We're just removing the the conflict by taking out the, the language that's in, in the zoning chapter now and just making a reference to the new language. And there's there's a reference in there to how much clearance needs to be left for uh, people to get through on the public sidewalk and how high the barrier can be. If there's going to be a barrier in order to serve alcohol, you have to have a certain barrier. It used to be six feet, and so it's my understanding that uh, that was maybe a little draconian. People looked like they were in jail or something behind these fences that's all so now the, the I think the height is three feet uh, so it's uh, just uh, changes to the ordinance to allow uh, permitting of uh, the encroachment into the right-of-way uh, and this would run through uh, the planning department at first but anything that encroached more than I think is 42 inches out uh, would have to also go to the City Council for for their approval so that's basically the gist of it. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Any questions or comments, commissioners? Uh, the motion is to approve all three items. So, okay. Uh, any discussion? Um, just started and said, but thank you very much to the individuals from MABC for showing up to the steering committee and helping us mull through this. It is, it is much appreciated, so thank you. Um, with that, call the roll. March. Hansen? Yes. Carpenko? Yes. Larchus? Yes. Wegness? Yes. Wetzler? Yes. Chairman Neither? Yes. Motion carried. With that, I have, no, oh, please. Uh, in lieu of the recent uh, resignation, are we required to uh, elect new chairman and assistant chairman? Uh, we elect the chairman or new officers next month, right? Is it next month? Correct, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, if there's no other discussion, meeting adjourned.